thought it was needful to set forth these qualifications, or not necessarily to set them forth, but to put them in mind of qualifications that were already in place and already established. And there were many reasons that Paul felt like it was necessary to speak on these qualifications and to write to Timothy and Titus on these qualifications, and we could speak in great length on that one point tonight. But I think Paul sums it up quite nicely when he tells Titus, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers um, uh, who are out there, and he goes on to talk about how they subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not to teach for filthy lucre's sake. And there's a lot of that that goes on today, and that's certainly one of the reasons that I believe this teaching is needful in the day in which we live in today. So as we keep these thoughts in mind tonight and we look into the Word of God, I want to take a few moments here to read these verses which pertain to the qualifications of a bishop. And you'll find these in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also in Titus chapter 1. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 first, and then we'll flip over and read some verses in Titus chapter 1. Notice with me in the Word of God in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 1. It says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no, uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil." Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let's stop there and flip on over to Titus chapter number 1 and begin reading here in verse number 6 in Titus chapter 1. Paul says in this epistle, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word that he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So, with that scripture read, what exactly is a bishop tonight? Maybe some may not understand fully what we're referring to, uh, and many people are confused today on what a bishop is and what his responsibilities are. A bishop is a pastor. Uh, the same thing. He's also called the overseer. He's called the under-shepherd. He's referred to in the Word of God as the steward of God. pastor is also an elder of the church. He serves under the head of the church, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of God's people. A bishop is more than just a preacher tonight, as it's possible to be a preacher without being a bishop, as Paul clarified that plainly in the book of Ephesians when he said God's given some pastors, he's given some evangelists. He makes a distinction between the two. He's given some teachers. So God has given out these different gifts, but a bishop tonight... He has many responsibilities, and I'd like to briefly go over these responsibilities uh, in order that it might better help us to understand the qualifications of a bishop uh, tonight. So henceforth, I want to establish and make it understood that from this point forward, if I refer to a pastor, I'm talking about a bishop because it's the same thing, okay? So he coordinates and empowers and this is a part of the pastor's job and a duty as a Christian servant and a leader. Uh, he coordinates and empowers other people to work in the ministry. The pastor, under the prayerful leadership of God, provides direction for the church. He provides the uh, church with a vision that comes from the Lord. Pastors equip other people to bring God's vision to completion. Pastors are ministers. They work in the ministry, but they also provide leadership to the local body, the congregation, and they engage other people to work in the ministry also. People, tonight, ministry is not meant to be a spectator sport that you watch from the sidelines. 
Every member in the church congregation has a, a ministry or should have a ministry, gifts and callings of God. It's the pastor's job to empower people to work in the ministry and then encourage people uh, to work in the ministry. It's the pastor's duty to give people opportunities to work in the ministry. See, a good pastor is not somebody who does everything himself. But a good pastor is someone who nurtures and encourages other people to do the work of God. He's not supposed to do everything himself. No, he encourages and nurtures these other folks. So, and another thing I want to insert right here, it's not on the PowerPoint, but it saddens me today uh, to say this, but most churches that I've ever been a part of in my life, uh, when they're in need of a pastor, do you know what they'll do? They'll hold a popular democratic vote of the congregation uh, to appoint a pastor. Well, there's a problem with that. Not one time in the Bible will you ever find where a church leader was appointed by a popular congregational vote. They're always appointed in the Word of God uh, by prayer and fasting of other elders. Because, and the reason for that is, is elders are men whose God has set aside uh, to do this sort of thing who are supposed to be faithful to God and faithful to God's work. The problem when we have a popular congregational vote to determine a pastor is you're giving the hypocrite, the lost church member, and the backslider the same vote as you're giving the elders who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the church, and not one time in the Word of God will you ever find where that ever happened in the Bible whatsoever. Elders are appointed by other elders. Amen. So if we deny this, we're denying the scripture and we're denying how God sets forth these things uh, in, in the word of God. A worldly Christian, even a lost church member, he's not going to cast his vote according to God's will. He's going to cast his vote based on his own bias, his own opinions, his own uh, earthly and worldly persuasion. He doesn't have God's will at heart. So, so we see a problem there, and, uh, and this is the way it is in the Word of God. Elders and pastors and such are appointed by other elders and pastors as after much prayer and much fasting. Now, that's the biblical way to do it. I'm sad to say I've not been a part of a church that does it that way, uh, but uh, nonetheless, that's the Bible way. Pastors govern the church, and they preach. Pastors guard the church doctrine. That's important today. People act like doctrine's a bad thing. That's not what Jesus said. Amen. Doctrine's a good thing, but it's got to be the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the truth. Amen. It's my job as, the, as a pastor here to guard the doctrine, guard the pulpit, fill the pulpit. We can't have one person up teaching one doctrine and then somebody else stand up and teach another doctrine. We can't have that type of thing going on here in the Word of God. Uh, uh, pastors exercise church authority. Now, let me be clear. You'll find in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3 that the Bible does not permit a pastor to lord it over the flock. Amen? No. Uh, see, what a pastor does is he's a servant to the flock. And uh, uh, thank God. Uh, but the Bible doesn't allow the pastor also. Uh, we, don't, we don't stand up and get puffed up and say, I'm the man, I'm in charge, I have authority. No, we're here to serve you. Amen. We don't lord it over the flock. We're here to be servants. We're here to minister. Uh, we're here to fulfill the will of God. But also, likewise, a pastor is not to shirk his responsibilities and throw that off on the congregation because he's afraid to make a decision so he's just going to have some sort of popular uh, democratic vote of the congregation because he's afraid to make a decision. We can't do that either. Uh, and there may be certain issues in the church that it'll be well and fine to have a popular vote on, but too, at the same time, we have to understand that there's just some decisions that the pastor's going to have to make. Because he's the one who's going to be accountable for it. The one who's going to ultimately stand and bear that responsibility for the direction that that church goes. There's nothing wrong tonight with seeking other people's advice. There's nothing wrong tonight with giving the members of a church a voice. I believe we ought to do that. And showing that, that uh, the pastor is concerned and cares about what the congregation believes and feels. And we should do that. But sometimes we've just got to make a decision. And maybe there will be times that it's not going to be a popular decision. But it's the pastor's duty to exercise church authority and to make sure that every decision that's made in that church is done so in consistence with the Word of God and what the Word of God says. So 
Pastors lead the financial affairs. And I firmly believe in financial openness. I firmly believe that we all have a right to know where the money's going, where the funds are being spent. I believe in uh, that this ought to happen. The congregation ought to have a voice in financial issues. But once again, the ultimate accountability falls on the pastor. Amen. And you'll not hear me say that there's never any instance or, or situation that will ever arise that the church shouldn't go in debt. And I could think of one in particular, but I don't have time to get into it tonight. You'll never hear me say that under no circumstance whatsoever should the church be in debt. I'll, I'll not say that. And if you want to know why later on, I'll be happy to tell you. But on the other hand, the pastor of the church has absolutely no right whatsoever. He has no biblical grounds whatsoever to drive the church in debt and then just expect the congregation to flip the bill for it. He has no right whatsoever, according to the Bible, to do that. There's nothing unbiblical about discussing financial matters with members and seeking advice. But once again, the decisions that are made, they need to be made in accordance with the will of God. So we see this, and this is the way it should be for a pastor uh, uh, to uh, run the financial affairs of the church. Pastors resolve disputes. A pastor, it's his obligation to take the word of God and uh, resolve disputes. You don't just ignore it and sit back and wait and hope that it's going to work itself out, but you take the word of God and you handle these matters according to biblical principles. Pastors are responsible for the testimony of Jesus Christ to the world. We need to be at work today and we need to be working hard to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being spread far and wide. That's part of our job. That's part of our duties as a pastor. Amen. Uh, we're responsible for this. We're responsible for praying for the sick. You'll find this in James chapter 5, talking about the prayer of faith. We need to believe this. Amen. Because obeying this scripture in James chapter 5 is an act of faith. And if we don't believe this, then there's no need for us to expect much of a result. A pastor ought to be committed to God's word and prayer. And it's been said that prayer is the lifeblood of the church. I believe that. A pastor has got to set aside time for prayer and Bible study. He simply must. So this is what a pastor or a bishop is. This is some of his responsibilities. We could go on for months on this, but I'm giving you some of his responsibilities tonight. Now, let's get into the qualifications. And these qualifications are listed tonight to help us to determine who should be allowed to fill the office of a pastor. Let's read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1 again. Uh, Paul says, This is a true saying. If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Within this verse is what I call the hidden qualification. If a man is going to be a pastor, he's got to want the job. He's got to desire the job. If you have to talk him into it, twist his arm, or continually persuade and, and beg him on your hands and knees to be a pastor, chances are you've got the wrong man. He's got to desire the job. Paul calls the office a good work. That's what the pastor desires. He, des he desires a good work. This shows that he has something on his shoulders more so than just an office to fill. He desires a good work. A good work means this is a noble task. It's a noble task to be a pastor. One who desires it desires a good work. He eagerly desires it. He's covetous of it in a good sense. He is ambitious for it. You know, being a pastor is noble in the eyes of God. It's a noble work. It's a form of servanthood. But it is work. Amen. Yes. If he desires to be a pastor, then what does he desire? He doesn't desire a title in front of his name. He doesn't desire a large office. He doesn't desire some platform for greatness. He doesn't desire a large salary. No, he desires a good work. That's what the man desires. So here then is the first qualification of a pastor. He's got to want the job. This ought to be a God-given desire that moves him to action, that speaks to his heart and, and prompts him to do something. You, you may have the wrong man if you have to talk him into it. You may have the wrong man if you have to beg and plead and persuade and, and continually deal with him to try to be a pastor. But I will say this also, reluctance isn't always a bad thing. Maybe... 
he feels inadequate. Maybe he doesn't fully understand the task. It's not always a bad thing if he's reluctant. Because we certainly don't want to put anybody in this position that's going to take the job lightly. So he's got to want the job. But it's not always a bad thing to be reluctant. If he's got a settled unwillingness to do it, that's a different story. That may be a sign that you need to look for someone else to do the job. Here's two things to think about. If a pastor of a church has such an awesome job, then churches ought to uphold their pastors before the congregation. They should pray for and encourage their pastors and show appreciation for the pastors that God has given. Young men and women should be taught that pastorship in a local church is, uh, is a worthy calling. Too often what happens is we make negative comments about our pastors, we make negative comments about our deacons and other elders and servants in the church, and we wonder why our teenagers drop out of church as soon as they can. How much better would it be to uphold godly pastors and leaders and challenge our children to aspire uh, to be this type of leader one day if God would uh, call them into this type of ministry? How much better would it be tonight? So we see the first and often hidden qualification, or the second and hidden qualification, is he must desire the job. If he doesn't desire the job, then he can't be a pastor. Let's read on here. Let's look at verse number 2. A bishop then must be blameless. This is the next qualification. He's got to be blameless. This is the one great all-inclusive qualification. It's really the only qualification for a pastor. All of the other, other qualifications that are mentioned and listed in the Word of God, they're nothing more than checkpoints to determine this one thing, blamelessness. Blamelessness. Every other qualification that's listed in these verses falls under the umbrella of blamelessness. This is the great all-inclusive qualification. This is a man who has given evil people no occasion whatsoever to blame or, or accuse him in any way. This is a man without a handle, if you can get the picture. A man that no one can grab a hold of and hold him down and accuse him. He's blameless. It means he's above reproach. This word serves as a summary of all the characteristics that a pastor should possess. It describes a garment without any folds, so there could be no hidden pockets of sin, no wickedness, no secret sin in his life. It means the pastor should have absolutely nothing in his life whatsoever that would enable someone else to be able to bring an accusation against him. You know, pastors are often attacked. They're often criticized. Their motivations and, and uh, everything are, are criticized. But a good, godly pastor who is truly blameless, a man who is truly above reproach, he'll be able to weather the storm. Amen. No questionable conduct, no secret sins, no deliberately unresolved conflicts and issues and alts with other people. None of this. But if it seems a little too discouraging tonight, I do want to mention that blamelessness is not sinless perfection. Sinless perfection is not possible for any Christian, much less the pastor. It doesn't mean he has to be sinlessly perfect. When we require a pastor to be sinlessly perfect, we distort this word out of its true meaning. No one's sinlessly perfect in this world today. It's not possible for any Christian whatsoever. Many church congregations, they'll take this high standard of blamelessness and set it up there and use that as an excuse to keep from appointing a pastor because for whatever reason, they don't want one. They'd rather do it on their own and try to handle things their way. Absolutely. So they'll just say, well, I can't find a man who's blameless, therefore we just won't put a pastor in. Friends, this is not an excuse to keep from appointing a pastor. You'll not find a perfect man. You'll not find a man without faults. 
But praise God, he still says in his word to appoint elders and pastors and deacons to serve in the church. You'll not find a perfect man. But this man who's blameless, he's a man that no wickedness can be proven in his life. He's like a skillful pugilist or a swordsman who's always guarding every part of his body so no one can bring an, uh, uh, an accusation against him. He ought to live the kind of life that's irreproachable in order for him to be able to reprove others without being reproved himself. This word blameless is referring to a model Christian life. We should expect nothing less, nothing less from our pastors. Because if a blameworthy man, someone who's full of sin and someone who's full of reproach is placed into the pastoral ministry, then being in the lead, you know what's going to happen? The whole church and the congregation and the testimony of the gospel is going to suffer. I don't care if he preaches sound doctrine. If he's a blameworthy man, the doctrine he preaches is going to be discredited because of his sinful condition. This is why a man in the pastor's position should be blameless. And I want to say this. We don't determine blamelessness based on gossip, backbiting, and false accusations. Amen. A lot of people will get mad at the pastor for telling them the truth and then go out here and start running him down. Absolutely. Old Brother Bird's a wicked, two-timing, yellow-bellied, dirty, low-down dog, somebody might say. But blamelessness is not determined by what people say about you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, you're going to suffer these things. You'll be reviled. You'll be persecuted. They'll say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It's not determined by what they say. If someone's running you down and you're a pastor, that's not a testimony against you. That's a testimony against the people that are running their mouth. So we don't determine blamelessness by what everybody's saying. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? It's going to happen. People are going to talk regardless, no matter what kind of life you live. They're going, to, they're going to run their mouths. They're going to say things to try to bring you down. It's inevitable, but it's going to be that way with every Christian. Everyone who's living godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution, not just the pastor. You know, blamelessness is a truly high standard, but it's not when, and when you consider the proportion of the church's mission in this world. It's not very high at all. We need to have blameless men in the pulpits today because the church and its mission hangs in the balance. So we see, not only is it possible for the pastor to be blameless, he must be blameless. He must be blameless. Now, let's get on into number two a little further. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Well, you know, the Bible mentions several characteristics and requirements concerning a pastor's family life and churches suffer when these are ignored and downplayed if we ignore these things we do so at our own peril that's why I'm teaching this series we can't ignore these we can't downplay them at all he must be the husband of one wife but unfortunately this qualification has been so wrapped up in controversy down through the years that what's happened is we've missed its true and essential teaching. We've missed the point of exactly what it was Paul was talking about when he said the bishop must be the husband of one wife. Well, in the Greek, literally, a man of one woman. Sometimes it's translated a man of one woman. Sometimes it's translated husband of one wife. But we know that it's talking about married people by reading the context of the Scripture, talking about children and whatnot. So it's apparent that when Paul wrote the letters to Titus and Timothy, uh, telling them to go out and appoint elders and ordain elders into the church, that he was telling them to look in the married community to do that. He must be the husband of one wife. So what does it mean to be the husband of one wife? Well, I found what I call five popular opinions. Five popular opinions, and that's what I want to look at right now. First of all, some people will say that uh, for a pastor to be the husband one wife means that he shouldn't be a polygamist. He shouldn't be married to two and three women at one time. A lot of people will say, well, Paul was referring to Christianized Jews who had taken 
two and three wives at a time under the Mosaic law. You remember how the patriarchs of old, back in the Old Testament, some of them had a lot of wives. A lot of people will say that that's what Paul was talking about. A lot of people will say that he was referring to uh, Greeks, New Testament Greeks, who were married to two and three women at the same time. That's opinion number one. Here's opinion number two. Some say he must simply be a man who is married to one woman at a time and that it's okay to divorce one wife and marry another. That's opinion number two. Here's opinion number three. Some people say he must be a man who has never been divorced or remarried. That's opinion number three. Opinion number four. Some people say he must be a man who has never remarried after the death of his first wife. That's the fourth opinion that I've found. Opinion number five. A pastor must be a man who is faithful to his wife. Let's go back and talk about these. Opinion number one, and I think most people will agree tonight that a pastor shouldn't be a polygamist. I believe the Bible forbids a pastor from being a polygamist. He can't be married to two and three women at one time. In regards to New Testament Greeks, there was polygamy going on. It was present in certain cultures of the time, but it was not the predominant lifestyle. It, wasn't a, it wouldn't have been what was first and foremost on Paul's mind when he said this. It was an issue. It was going on at the time. It's still a problem today in some places in the world, and it was going on back then. But Paul had something else in mind. He wasn't concerned about the few people who were polygamists who had two and three wives at a time. He had something more profound on his mind when he said the bishop must be the husband of one wife. Amen. Because by far and away, the predominant style of marriage, even among Greeks in the New Testament, and I'm not basing this on some commentary I pulled off the Internet because I, I can assure you I've read them all. I've read them all. The predominant lifestyle was by far and away monogamous marriages between one man and one woman. Okay, so that's where Paul would have been thinking. He wouldn't have been concerned about the few Greeks who were married to two and three women at one time. So I believe Paul was talking about something more profound. But I believe we can all agree, most people will agree anyway, that this is certainly included in the husband of one wife. Opinion number two. He must be a man who's married to one woman at a time and it's okay to divorce one wife and marry another. Well, friends, this type of person is not a faithful one-woman man. Paul never said it was okay for a man to put away a good wife and go marry somebody else he liked better, uh, you know, and, and think he's still qualified to be a pastor because he's just got one wife at the present moment, okay? That's not what the Bible's teaching. It'd be dangerous to have this type of man as a pastor in the church, type of man who'd divorce his wife on unscriptural grounds and run out and go marry somebody else. If he can't be faithful to one wife, how's he going to be faithful over the work of God? Absolutely. Opinion number three. And there are a lot of good arguments. Some people say he must be a man who's never been divorced or remarried. There's a lot of good arguments for and against this opinion and this ideal that he must be a man who's never been divorced or remarried. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, when you get into reading the commentaries on the Internet, you're going to find a lot of different views on this. And uh, the fact of the matter is, there is such a thing as a scriptural divorce. And we need to know and understand and be aware of that. Jesus said in Matthew 19 and 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And we can gather from the context there that it's talking about a man who puts away his wife because she's unfaithful. This tells us that in the event of marital unfaithfulness, that one is justified in seeking a divorce. It's not God's greater plan. It wasn't God's will from the beginning. But nonetheless, we can't overlook the fact that this provision is there except it be for fornication. Right there it is in words of red. Jesus said, except it be for fornication, if a man puts away his wife and marries another, he commits adultery. God hates divorce. It wasn't his will from the beginning. He'd rather two people stay together and work it out, be forgiven and all of this. But nonetheless, the provision is given in the event of marital unfaithfulness. And that's not all. 
Did you know that there's also a provision given in the Word of God for the departure of an unbelieving spouse? If you don't believe me, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. It says this, and I want you to pay attention to this. It says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. That's what the Word of God says. But God hath called us to peace. Well, not under bondage to what? Well, you can gather from the context. If you go back and read the Scripture around it, it's talking about the law of marriage. Paul is saying if you're married to an unbeliever and that unbeliever leaves you, then you're not under any type of bondage to that relationship. That means that there's no restrictions placed on you. If there's no restrictions and we're not under bondage to the law of marriage to that unbelieving spouse, then we are completely and totally free to remarry, but only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. In light of this, we cannot rightly say in the Word of God that under no circumstances whatsoever say that a, a, a divorced man should never be a pastor. What you have to do is take every situation and consider that individually. And look at it individually, every situation, and, and that's how you determine that. I can't stand up here and tell you that if a man's been divorced, he's not qualified to be a pastor just because he's been divorced because the Bible doesn't teach that. But I will say this, I believe that most men who have been divorced, they're going to have a harder time meeting this qualification. Absolutely. If he's got alimony to pay, he's got to run his kids back and forth, he's got to work out all this, he's got to cater to every whim of his ex-wife, he's got to, uh, you know, deal with unresolved issues, let old wounds heal and all this and that. He's not a one-woman man. He can't give his attention to one woman. But this doesn't exclude every divorced and remarried man from the office. If they're divorced for scriptural reasons, they're covered by the Bible. You might say, but Brother Vern, somebody might talk about him. Somebody might try to bring reproach on the church by running their mouth about him. Well, what did I tell you earlier? We don't determine blamelessness based on what people are running their mouth about. People are going to talk and complain regardless. It's a testimony against them, not the man of God. Some people, will, I love this. Some people will take that blessed scripture from Matthew 19 and 6, which says, What God hath joined together, let not, not man put asunder. And they'll take that and try to twist it around and teach the false doctrine that says divorce, all divorce, regardless of what the situation is, is unbiblical and unscriptural. But I say that verse is true. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. To that I say, Amen. That's a wonderful verse in the Word of God. But the key words are what God hath joined together. Amen. That's what we have to pay attention to. There are a lot of marriages out there tonight, friends, that God doesn't have anything to do with. Amen. People today who preach this false doctrine are taking, going back in men's past, years and years before they ever got saved and God made them a new creature, washed their sins away and gave them a new, uh, gave them a new start and pointed at something that happened years ago and say, look, you hear what happened to you? But God doesn't work that way. He doesn't hold us under bondage to keep us down and determine our future. That's what the devil does. There's marriages out there today that God doesn't have anything to do with. And they'll say, well, you might have been a lost man, but you still went before God and took a vow before God. I've heard it time and time again. The problem is, if that's the case, and uh, two lost people go before God, and they make a vow before God in marriage, even if they're lost, and then one day after they're divorced, and maybe later on they got remarried and they got saved, and someone tries to use that against them and say, well, you still took a vow before God, and God expects you to stay true to it. Well, if that's the case, then what do you say about all these homosexuals that are getting married today? They're going, they, they say, well, they're standing before God. We know better, but that's what they're saying, and getting married... And and saying that they're taking a vow before God, what happens if they get saved? According to that theology, well, you just tell them, well, they ought to just stay together. They took a vow before God. Friends, we know better than that. So that puts the rest. The key words here, it doesn't say what the devil joined together, let not man put asunder. It says what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
Amen. Just because somebody says that they're taking a vow before God doesn't mean God has anything to do with it. Marriage is a sacred institute ordained by God, but not everyone out there saying they're getting married uh, according to this sacred institute that is ordained by God means that God's uh, supporting it at all. That's the key words to remember. What God hath joined together, let not man put us under. Here's another false argument that I've heard false teachers use to try to hinder the work of the Lord. I've heard this said time and time again because I've paid attention to it since the Lord saved me back in 2001. I've paid attention to every word that's ever been said on this subject, and I've gone home and studied about it. And uh, I've heard this, and I want to share it with you. This has been spoken by so-called creatures. They'll take that verse in Matthew uh, 19 and 9, which says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever, whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. That once uh, one gets a divorced, a divorce even as a lost person, and then later remarries, that it doesn't matter. They're perpetually and continually forevermore committing adultery. Have you ever heard that one? That it doesn't matter what you do. You're perpetually committing adultery. And they'll go back and say, well, the, you go back in the Greek and you study that word. And I'm all for going back in the Greek, but the problem is this. Not everybody who claims to be a Greek scholar is a Greek scholar. There's a lot of people that say they are, but there's very few that really are. And they'll say that you're com continually committing adultery. Well, the problem with that argument is they overlook one little element, which is called the grace of God. Does the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ have the power to break the yoke of bondage or not? Is his grace sufficient or not? Is he able to make a new creature or not? I, I submit unto you, friends, that he is. That his grace is sufficient. Yes, you'll make mistake, mistakes and you'll have to suffer the consequences for those mistakes, but it doesn't trump the plan of God by any means. His grace is sufficient. Am I using this to try to downplay marriage? or say that it's not important. No, you've not heard me say that at all. I believe marriage is a sacred institute of God that needs to be fought for at any cost. And a pastor ought to uphold that. And I truly believe what God hath joined together, let not, not man put asunder. I had, a, I had a man tell me one time that uh, the reason that he didn't believe a divorced man should pastor a church was because that after David committed his sin with Bathsheba, that God said, the sword shall not depart from your house. Well, friends, what exactly happened there? David committed adultery, got this woman pregnant, lied to everybody about it, tried to cover it up, and then had the man killed. That's a little different than just getting a divorce. See how people twist things to try to prove their own doctrines and teachings? Let's move on to opinion number four. A lot of people will say, well, being the husband one wife means that even if his first wife dies, that he shouldn't remarry. I don't see how that could possibly be intended here as it contradicts what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 6, and 9, 6 through 9. And I encourage you to go read these verses. It contradicts what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, concerning folks who remarry after the death of a spouse other good verses concerning this are first corinthians chapter 7 verses 39 and 40 first timothy chapter 5 and verse 14 where the context is dealing with young widows paul's teachings are plain if a spouse dies we're free to remarry bottom line no question about it a lot of people who, again, claim to be great Greek scholars, they'll try to tell you that when that verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 says the bishop must be the husband of one wife, that it means first and only wife. Have you ever heard that one before? It means first and only wife. Well, how could that be so? A man who's been married and his wife dies, he's free to remarry. It's obvious from the Bible. Go read the scriptures yourself and see what it says. If a man's wife dies, he's free to remarry. But you know what? Once he remarries, that woman will never be his first and only wife. So that kind of puts that argument to rest. That it's talking about first and only. Doesn't matter how you slice it. 
He's completely justified in remarrying, but she'll never be his first and only wife. She's his second wife. His first wife's dead. So that argument doesn't always apply, the first and only. Opinion number five. This opinion suggests that Paul has in mind marital faithfulness as a characteristic of a godly pastor. Why is this important? Because if a man's not faithful to his wife, how can he be trusted uh, to be faithful in his other dealings and his other obligations? How can he be trusted to be faithful in his work for the Lord? If he cheats on his wife, where else is he going to cheat? Friends, I present to you tonight that this is exactly what Paul was talking about when he said the bishop must be the husband of one wife. Uh, the literal Greek phrase reads, he must be a man of one woman. I told you before, sometimes it's translated man of one woman. Sometimes it means husband of one wife. We can gather that he's talking about children and other things. He was talking about people who were obviously married. All the scripture is saying here is that the pastor must have an exclusive relationship with one woman and one woman only, his wife. That's what Paul's talking about. There's no implication whatsoever in this verse you can go back to the Greek, study on it whatsoever. There's no implication even mentioned about divorce. It's not even brought up. There were specific Greek words that Paul could have used if he was talking about divorce. He never used those words because he wasn't talking about divorce. Now, if Paul was talking about divorce, he would have said divorce because he wasn't the type of preacher to beat around the bush and to sugarcoat things. If he'd have meant divorce, he'd have come out and said divorce, but he didn't say divorce. It's not even applied. It's not even addressed whatsoever in any way in this verse here. But I'll go ahead and tell you, there are many commentators who will agree in saying that this means that a man is not to remarry if his first wife still lives, but that doesn't change the fact that no matter how you interpret what it says, no matter how you interpret this, all it says is he must be a man of one woman. That's all it says. It don't make no difference how you interpret it. That's what it says. He must be a man of one woman. That means he must be faithful to his wife. It's not talking about divorce. It's not even talking about how many times you've been married or exactly what a good marriage consists of. He's saying that the bishop must be faithful to his wife. And that's what he's saying. Both Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, they both address divorce in other places in the Bible. Paul doesn't address it here. He says the bishop must be the husband of one wife. He's not talking about divorce. He talked about divorce in other places. And so did Jesus. And you know what? You know what I found out? Everything that's ever said in the Bible concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it applies to all Christians. There's not two sets of standards for this. You'll not find it in the Word of God. You'll not find where it says this is the marriage standard for pastors and this is the marriage standard for Christians. Preachers that are out there preaching that a man who's been divorced and remarried is not qualified uh, to be a pastor, you know what they're saying? They're saying that if a man's been divorced and remarried, he's not qualified to be a Christian because there's not two sets of standards. One for pastors and one for everyone else. Everything that's mentioned in the Word of God for marriage and divorce applies to all of us. Everybody. All Christians. Not just to one or two here and there. But you know, there, there are, and I want to say this, there are some well-meaning people out there. And they preach this out of good intentions because they have desire to guard the pulpit, they don't want to bring reproach upon the church, good-hearted motivations, they're cautious, they don't want anybody in the pulpit that, that shouldn't be in the pulpit, good-hearted people with good intentions, there's some of them out there that's that way. I'll grant that. And then there's some downright agents of the devil that preach this false and erroneous teaching right here for no other reason than to keep God's people under bondage. 
I don't know what authority they find to teach this, friends, but I can tell you one thing, it doesn't come from the Word of God. You know what disqualifies a man from being a pastor? It's anything reprehensible in his marriage to his wife. That's what disqualifies a man from being a pastor. A man's got to be faithful to his wife. That's what Paul's saying. Nothing else is mentioned. He simply has to be faithful to his wife. Well, here's some questions we ought to ask concerning our pastors. Is he a flirt? Does he have a wandering eye? Are his affections centered on his wife? Does he demonstrate that affection and loyalty in ways that others can see? Is his marriage a model for others to follow? Is he above reproach in his dealings with the opposite sex? Is his life free from the bondage of pornography? Friends, y'all know as well as I do tonight, there's a lot of men out there who's been married to one woman all their life that have trouble. And you know what? When they do, I don't care what their marital situation is, they're not the husband of one wife because they're not faithful to their wife, as Paul says that we should be. So that's why I regard this standard as it's simply, it's a higher standard than just asking you know, when we consider a pastor, this is a much higher standard than just saying, well, has he ever been divorced? The real question is, is he faithful to his wife? Amen. That's the question. That's the real issue at hand here. And that's the question we need to be considering. This isn't even a marital qualification at all. This is a moral qualification. The bishop must be faithful to his wife. This means that he cannot be engaged in homosexuality or any other type of unquestioned or questionable, questionable behavior. He's got to be faithful to his wife. And in so doing, then he'll be able to set forth an example for others in the congregation to follow. And that's what we need. That's what's required of us in the Word of God as pastors. And there'll be many that hear this message, this teaching that's not here tonight. And there may be churches, people in churches listening on the radio that are looking for a pastor. And they may need to keep some of these things in mind. That's what God requires of us in that element of our family life. And there'll be more, more of this to come later on. Uh, but for now, let's move on does this mean with regard to unmarried men, men who have never had a wife, men who have never ever been married before? Well, I've actually changed my viewpoint on this issue as a result of this study to what I believe to be a more vi uh, biblical viewpoint. In short, yes, he must be the husband of one wife, which tells us that he must be a married man. Although the Greek phrase simply reads, a man of one woman, we know that marriage is indicated here because the mention of the bishop having children and ruling his house well. Paul wouldn't have been talking about a man ruling his house well with a woman and children that he wasn't married to. So we gather here that he, he must be a married man. And I know what some of you may be thinking, and it could be the same thing that I used to think. And that's, well... Jesus wasn't married. Paul wasn't married. According to this, then Jesus and Paul wouldn't be qualified to be a pastor. That's what I used to think. But you know what? That's kind of a fleshly way of looking at things. Jesus Christ is not here on earth today in a bodily form manifested as a man who desires the office of a bishop in the local church. Jesus Christ doesn't have to be a man to come down here and pastor a church. He's the reason for the church. He's the bishop. He's another kind of bishop. He's the high priest and bishop of our souls, the Bible says. He's the reason for the church. He has no need to come down here and pastor a church. He's the reason for it, amen. amen. And Paul, well, we can gather from the Bible that Paul was a, 
widower. So he would have had, had to have had the proper experience with marriage because I've studied a lot on qualifications of a Pharisee. You know, they had to go through a lot to be a Pharisee. They had to be linguist. They had to uh, hold the three other offices of gradually increasing dignity before they got to be a Pharisee. One of the qualifications of being a Pharisee was he had to be a married man. He had to be a Hebrew of Hebrews. Both parents had to be full-blooded Jews. So in order, Paul said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So that tells us at one point in time, Paul would have had to have been a married man. But the scripture give us clue, gives us clues to indicate that Paul's wife had died. Okay, so the fact that Paul was at one point a Pharisee would indicate that he would have had, had plenty of experience with marriage. Friends, Paul would have been well qualified. He would have been well qualified. It's apparent, though it's not found in the Greek, that when you're looking at the context here, Paul writes these letters to Titus and Timothy. He's telling them to look in the married community to appoint these elders and these leaders. And, uh, you know, this puts the rest of teaching that uh, church leaders ought to be celibate. Celibacy has never been required of a church leader. Never. So that puts that to rest. So here's the reasoning behind this. Here's the reason why the pastor should be a married man. Well, first of all, God looked down from heaven and he saw man in the beginning and he said it's not good that man should be alone. So what did he do? He created a helper, didn't he? The good old King James that we use here says it's a, he's a created a help meet, a helper. A man without experience in marriage he's going to have a lot of difficulty pastoring a church because God uses the marriage of the pastor and every other Christian couple for that matter, but especially more so the pastor since the pastor is in a leadership position in the church and people look to the pastor. God uses the pastor's marriage to demonstrate the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church. So technically, when you look at it that way, Jesus Christ is married. He's married to the church or betrothed, if you prefer, ever how you choose to look at that. And uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 and 33 uh, speak on this directly, and I highly recommend you take the time to go back and read those verses there. So God uses the marriage of a pastor and his wife to demonstrate this relationship of Christ and the church. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And yes, as we discussed earlier, this is a qualification for all Christians who are married. Therefore, don't you think that Christian people ought to have this type of example leading the church today? And it'd be difficult for a man without any marital experience to offer biblical counseling on marriage. And you know what? It disturbs me to no end for men to think that that's not part of a pastor's job because it is. A man who's never been married before, how's he going to offer any counseling on marriage? Uh, somebody who's a skeptic of this might say, well, all he ought to do is just open his mouth and speak what God tells him to speak and it'll be all right. The problem with that is every pastor, and the Bible touches on this when it lists the qualifications of deacons who are also elders, and those qualifications are almost identical that talks about going through a proven time, a time of being proved, a time of being tried. If a man never has had a wife whatsoever in his life, that's going to deprive him of a lot of valuable experience and being a, a, a leader and a, a, a biblical marriage counselor as it is part of a pastor's responsibility to do that. Now, personally, I'm not extremely dogmatic about it. I believe the Bible says he ought to be the husband of one wife. He must be the husband of one wife. 
Now, I believe God's got his people in different places at different times for different reasons. But I'll say this, and we're almost finished for tonight, and we're going to stop and pick up the rest of this next week, and we're going to deal with some more things on this line, and then we're going to start hitting these qualifications pretty quick. The vast and overwhelming majority of people who say it's okay for a pastor to have never been married whatsoever in his life, they're still going to tell you that it's better if he is married. So take that for what it's worth. And that brings us to our last couple of questions on this husband and one wife. And I knew that I was going to have to devote the majority of the time to this one thing since it's been wrapped up in controversy for so long. But next week we're going to start moving a lot quicker. Okay? But we still, we still have a couple more questions to deal with on this husband and one wife thing. We're going to talk about those first thing next week. And that is, well, what about a pastor who just goes through a time of marital difficulty? Okay? He's a good, godly, good, qualified pastor. Husband and one wife. He's been faithful to his wife for years and years. And all of a sudden, bam, he has marriage problems. What about him? We'll talk about that next week. We're going to talk about the next obvious question. Well, must he be a man? We're going to have to put that off till next week. We're going to deal with that question. We're going to look at women pastors. I, I, some of you, <laughs> some of you, <laughs> some of you know me pretty well, and there's a couple of you just don't know where I'm going to go with that. welcome you tonight to our second lesson in this series on the qualifications of a bishop and we hope this series has been a blessing thus far and we pray that the Lord will use this teaching to have a, a positive impact and to make a difference in the lives of many we want you to grow in grace we want you to grow in knowledge each and every day and learn more of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the precious truth of the Word of God. So we desire your prayers tonight as we continue to stand and deliver this teaching series on this subject matter. I thank God for His love. I thank God for His mercy. thank God for His grace. And thank Him for helping us through each step of every day as we journey from this life to our eternal home. I'm thankful tonight for God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read once again. I want to read these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse number 1. And hopefully we'll all become very familiar with these scriptures by the time this series is completed. Paul writing here to Timothy says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop... He desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let's flip over to Titus chapter 1. And you'll notice, and I'd like to back up and catch verse 5 in Titus chapter 1. Paul says, For this cause... Left I thee in Crete, speaking to Titus, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine. 
See, doctrine's a good thing. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. By way of a brief review, last week we discussed some of the pastor's responsibilities and job specifications, and this list is not comprehensive at all, but this is a compacted list just to give us a general idea of some of the things that a pastor is responsible and some of the things that a pastor is supposed to be doing. He coordinates and empowers others to work. He governs the church and preaches. He guards the church doctrine. We talked about all this last week, and I just want to review this momentarily. He exercises church authority. He leads the financial affairs. He resolves disputes. He's responsible for the testimony of Jesus Christ to the world. He prays for the sick. He commits himself to the study of God's word and prayer. He must be a man who desires the job. We shouldn't have to plead with him to be a pastor. He has to have that God-given desire to fill the position which involves far more than just filling an office. He doesn't desire his name in lights. He doesn't desire uh, financial benefit. He doesn't desire praise of men, honor and glory uh, for himself. No, he desires a good work. Someone asked me just about a week ago, what's so hard about being a pastor? And I responded to that this way. I'm on call 24-7. My in, uh, motives and intentions are or question many times my decisions are questioned I'm under scrutiny my wife's under scrutiny my kids are under scrutiny and all of this because I desire a good work and I do truly a pastor must be a man who desires the job a pastor must be a man who's blameless without any hidden sin or wickedness in their life. No one should be able to find anything to hold over him uh, that will withstand an impartial uh, examination. And we discussed last week how that blamelessness is not sinlessness, but it's an example of a model Christian life. We should expect nothing less from our pastors today. The pastor must be the husband of one wife. We talked in great detail last week about the five popular opinions on what it means to be the husband of one wife and how that Paul wasn't referring to polygamy, uh, death of a spouse, divorce, uh, or any of these things. Paul was given a moral qualification by saying that the bishop must be a man who is faithful uh, to his wife. That's all the Bible's saying, but how profound indeed. Uh, that speaks volumes today. We discussed how the pastor must be a man who is married in order for God to use his marriage, according to Ephesians chapter 5, to display the relationship of Jesus Christ uh, and his church. And that ought to bring us up to speed tonight. So let's begin by uh, speaking about uh, another couple of questions in regard to this husband of one wife qualification and then, Lord willing, we'll be able to move on. We spoke last week about the provision in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15 concerning an unbelieving spouse departing from a believer. Those of you that were here last week, you remember that if the unbelieving spouse departs, then the believer is not any, uh, under any type of bondage to that relationship. And I do believe that that's what it's referring to. If you go back and read the Scripture, it's talking about the law of marriage. Uh, so we know that Paul is referring to the law of marriage, but what about an example where both are believers? We didn't talk about that last week. So let's, let's deal with this a little bit tonight. Even though we determined last week that there's not two separate sets of criteria uh, in regard to divorce. We don't have a standard for pastors and then a standard for everyone else. It's the same for everyone. We established that last week. So, But since we're talking about the qualifications of a pastor tonight, let's consider this. A, a pastor, suppose two people are married, a pastor uh, and, and his wife. And suppose for whatever reason that the wife, who's a Christian, professes Christ, decides that she leaves her husband the pastor, what should he do? Well, the first thing we need to keep in mind in a situation like this is as far as I've read in the Bible, there's no provision given for a believer who departs from another believer. The reason for that is because God expects Christian people uh, to stay married one to another. And uh, in this type of situation, I believe what we have here, and I've known of this to happen, uh, that would be a good opportunity for the pastor to fulfill his obligation to love his wife as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How many times have we sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, yet our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ remains true and faithful to us? We're his bride. 
the Bible says. But yet we make mistakes from time to time, don't we? We sin and we fall short of the glory of God. But thank God, Jesus Christ remains true and faithful. We're his bride. We make mistakes. I don't know about you. I've made plenty in my own life. And no doubt uh, many of you will know what I'm talking about because you've done the same thing. You've been guilty of it as well. Jesus Christ didn't leave us nor forsake us, did he? He stayed true. He stayed, fa he stayed faithful. You know, husbands are commanded to love their wives in Ephesians chapter 5 as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So uh, in a situation like this, and I'm not telling you it'd be easy, but that would be a good opportunity for that husband to demonstrate the love of Christ. And then, you know, later on down the road, if fornication occurs, then he'd be justified uh, in a divorce according to Matthew 19 and verse 9. Uh, but until that, there's no provision given there because God wants Christian people to stay together, don't he? He wants to hold Christian marriages together. So what about cases where God did join someone together? Years into the marriage, we have two people here that God has joined together. Years into the marriage, one makes a tremendous mistake, commits an act of unfaithfulness. The marriage collapses and falls to ruins because of the mistake of one and the unwillingness to forgive on, on the part of the other. What then? After all, God joined them together. Suppose that after this, years later, they end up remarried. They have children in this new marriage. They go to church. They're trying to get their lives right. They're drawing closer to God. And they're closer to God than ever before. Are these people damned to hell? in the category of those who are committing a per perpetual adultery, as some are preaching today, because they put asunder what God had joined together. How do you correct a situation like that? I don't know about you if you've ever thought about it. What would you do? Would you just get another divorce? Ruin, ruin the, the lives of those children? Ruin the lives of that family all over again? Well, friends, I believe there's one thing that we could all agree on in a situation like this. Two wrongs don't make a right. We've got to understand tonight that sin, uh, uh, divorce involves sin, and God hates divorce, but he hates all sin. He sent his son Jesus Christ to come down the cross of Calvary and, and, and die because of that, because he hates it so much that he wanted to deliver us from the power of sin. But listen, God is merciful. God is gracious. God is forgiven to those who will humble themselves before him uh, and, and confess their sins and ask for forgiveness. He's able to cleanse. He's able to renew. He's able to remold, reshape. He's able to pick up the broken pieces, put that back on the potter's wheel, and mold us and make us and reshape us and use us again for his glory. Friends, I want to tell you tonight, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. While adultery is not even the unforgivable sin. There's only one unforgivable sin mentioned in the Word of God, and we all know that that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. That's the only unforgivable sin you'll find mentioned in the Word of God. If you've made mistakes in your life, you've fallen short of the glory of God in your life, God still loves you. He's able to forgive you. He's able to show you mercy. He's able to uh, use your life to receive a glory for himself. He's not just going to throw you away. Some people will say amen to that part. They'll say, yeah, God loves you. Yeah, God uh, can forgive you, but you're still not allowed to do this and that and the other. Friends, I want to tell you tonight, if you ever had a calling in your life from God, whether it's to be a pastor, preacher, or anything else, that calling was there before you were ever even born into this world. Do you know that? And it's without repentance, the Bible says says. There's nothing that nobody can do that's going to change that. I'm thankful he's loving and merciful, aren't you? Amen. You may have to go through a time of growing. You may have to go through a time of learning uh, and chastisement, and that might take 20 years. But I can't stand up here and tell you tonight that God will never use you again. That's up to God. Peter denied Christ three times with cursing in his mouth. Did he ever preach the gospel again after that? You better believe he did. Read Acts chapter 2 and see if God used Peter. This was a great act of unfaithfulness on Peter's part, but God used him in a mighty way. He's still the same today. He's still able today. What about, a, what about a pastor who's doing fine, then all of a sudden he falls into some pit of marital turmoil? Well, when this happens, 
and I've known of this to happen, we need to ask ourselves this question. What kind of man do you want leading the church? Do you want a man who has the wisdom, the resourcefulness uh, to work his way through that problem and weather the storm? Who's able to manage and to work and to, to, and to get through problems and weather the storm? Or do you want somebody who's going to tuck tail and run at the first sign of trouble? That's the question we need to... Friends, I present unto you tonight that we need pastors in churches today who are able to weather the storm. You might go through something in your life one day. You may have a problem. You'll need a, a pastor who'll be able to speak to you and counsel you from the Word of God and his experience. Not somebody who's just going to roll over like a whipped dog and run at the first sign of a problem. Let him weather the storm. Give him a chance. That's when we could see what people are made of. Consider the situation in terms of identity. Okay, because there's a line here, and we need to be aware of this. When we're saved, our identity is in Jesus Christ, is it not? Our lives, the Bible said, are hid with Christ in God, and that's who we are. That's our identity as Christians. But consider it in terms of identity of God's people and how they see it when they're looking to this pastor for spiritual leadership and guidance. Is this just a man who's struggling with some kind of problem like all the rest of us are? Or has this man become defined by his problems? That's the difference there. His, or has his problems become who he is? If we've got a pastor who's just simply working his way through some difficulties, our response ought to be, first of all, we know nobody's perfect. We established that last week. We ought to pray for him, support him, encourage him, be there uh, to help him in any way as he demonstrates his God-given leadership abilities to get through the storm and manage his way through this problem. Amen. But once his life has become defined by the problems, what do we do then? Well, we still need to pray for him. We still need to support him. We still need to encourage him. We still need to do whatever we can to try to, to, to help him, whatever's necessary for, to, for him to get his life back on track. Uh, but he may need to take some time off before he continues as a pastor. But uh, I can't stand and say that God will never use him again. I'll say it's not impossible. That's up to God and the, uh, the severity of the circumstance and the problem that we're talking about. You know, with God, there's always hope for a better end. And I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, the sheep have got to be properly guarded. The sheep have got to be properly cared for. There's hope with God, amen, but if our lives as, as pastors are so messed up that we can't properly take care of the flock, we may, we may need to step back and heal for a little while. It might take a month. It might take 10 years. But God's still able to speak. God's still able to move. God's still able to use us. Amen. We need to get our lives back to the point where God can do that. And I've seen men with messed up problems in their life try to continue on being a pastor when they should have stepped down and stepped back and use that opportunity to grow and get closer to God. We need to move on here. Let's discuss the question that many of you have been waiting to hear answered. Must the pastor be a man? There are a few more hotly debated issues in the church today than women serving as pastors or even preaching for that matter. It's a hot topic. Well, first of all, we've got to realize that this is not an issue of men versus women. This is not about chauvinism. This is not about discrimination. The emphasis here is on upholding what God had long ago uh, laid out for marriage. The pastor, together with his wife and his family, is to be a shining light of what God intended for marriage to be. Marital faithfulness should not be in question in any such way that the message the pastor proclaims would be discredited at all. 
their marriage should be a clear distinction between what's going on out there in the world and what God desires for a marriage to be. But despite all the discussion that we've heard on just exactly what it means to be the husband and one wife, one thing is clear. A woman cannot be the husband of one wife. She just simply cannot. She will never, ever be the husband of one wife. It's not about chauvinism. It's not about discrimination. Now, there's a lot of women out there who will say that a woman is not qualified to be a pastor. There's a lot of men out there who will say, well, yes, she is. She can do anything that a man can do. But it's not about that. It's not about men versus women. The Bible only permits men to be pastors. This is not popular today with a lot of feminist movements. They denounce this position. They say this is chauvinistic. They even accuse the Apostle Paul of being a chauvinist for the things he said in the Word of God. They've adopted this politically correct social standard that permits women to be pastors of churches. And first of all, I want to be the first to say tonight that I believe that women are very underappreciated in the church. I believe that women are very underutilized in the local church. This is not a case of uh, talent or ability. There's a lot of women out there that make better preachers than men. But it's not about that. It's about calling. God's Word requires a man to be the pastor. We, we can't take God's Word and twist it around to make it fit our standard. When we get saved, we have a change of wants and desires. We adapt our lives to fit what the Word of God says. So you see, in the beginning, this is what happened. God created Adam. And God gave Adam authority to name the animals and whatnot there in the Word of God. And then afterwards, he created Eve to be a helper for Adam. And this is important because the Apostle Paul, when he talks about this, he refers to the order of creation when he uh, mentions the structure of the church and who ought to be the leaders in the church. He refers to this very thing. Let's look at it. Let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Let's pick up reading in here in verse number 12. Paul says, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, there's a lot of discussions we could have on these verses right here, but for the matter, matter at hand, let's focus on authority. Well, a lot of women, and I used to say this too, if they claim to be a minister, the definition of minister is a servant, so if you're a servant, how can you have any authority? But the problem with that is, is there's authority in the Word of God. Paul told Timothy, he said, Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. In another place in Titus, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have it, uh, just pulling it out of my mind, I believe it's in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 15, if I'm not mistaken. Another place where Paul mentions the authority here. Let's just flip over there and see if that's what it is. Right here in the 215, it says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So you see, there's authority in the Word of God. The woman is not to have authority over the man in the church context. Now, this doesn't extend out here into the workplace, it doesn't extend out here into politics. Uh, you know, I know the Bible says that the woman ought to be chaste keepers at home and all this and that, but for what we're talking about right now, you know, and there's a whole other set of arguments we can look at on all that, okay? But we're not dealing with that tonight. We're looking at the church context and the structure of it. The woman is not to have spiritual authority over the man. 
This is talking about in the church. In the Old Testament, the Bible speaks of Deborah as being a judge in Israel over men. And also in the New Testament, uh, the Bible mentions Phoebe. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, they all played an important role. Uh, in the Bible, women, especially in the New Testament, they supported the Apostle Paul in many areas. They were great servants. They were great helpers. But what Paul is speaking of here in these verses is the relationship between men and women in the church structure, not down at the workplace in politics, but the church. Paul speaks of pastors. He speaks of deacons. He speaks of other elders as being the husbands of one wife. He then speaks of women in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, and he mentions their obligation to receive instruction when he says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. In e each case, uh, the pastor, the deacons, and the elders of the church are instructed to be men. They're to be the husbands of one wife. So we see there's no commandment or there's no provision given in the Word of God for a woman to be the pastor of a church. And actually it mentions uh, the deacon's wives. They're instructed to be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. So why is it that the Word of God has singled out men and men only as pastors. It's because of the created order that Paul had already mentioned in the Bible. Furthermore, did you know that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament there are over 700 references to priests. Every one of them is a man. Now this is important because in the Old Testament the priest had an important office and an important duty of ministering the sacrifices in the Old Testament. Not one time is a priest ever referenced in the Old Testament when referring to a woman. Never did a woman do this job. So therefore, we could see in the Word of God, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and 1 Timothy 2 and 3, and Titus chapter 1, the proper person to hold the position of pastor of the church is to be a man. Well, what about Galatians 3.28? Let's turn over there and look at Galatians 3.28 in the Word of God. This verse is a verse that many women pastors will use to say that they can pastor a church. Galatians 3.28. Thank you, brother. Let's look at what it says here. Galatians 3.28. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse is often used to support women pastors because it says there is neither male nor female in Christ. And the argument they use states that, well, if there's neither male nor female and we're all equal, then women can be pastors. But unfortunately, those who use this verse this way they neglect to see the proper context of the Scripture. Back up there in Galatians 3 and verse 23, it talks about being under the law before faith came and how we're brought closer to Jesus Christ and we've become the sons of God by faith and how that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. We're Abraham's seed according to the promise of God. The point of this passage is that we're all saved by God's grace according to God's promise. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Jew, Greek, bond, free, male or female, if you're saved by the grace of God, we're all saved, uh, saved the same way. And in God's saving grace, there is neither male nor female. When we come to Jesus Christ and we come to Him sincerely, we're all equally and wholly in Him. It doesn't matter who we are, where we are, or what we are, there's no high and low at the cross, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. I could call on Jesus' name and a king can do the same. For those who come to the cross for God's salvation are equal in salvation. Paul's letting them know that it's not necessary for us as Gentile people uh, to keep the Jewish law to be saved. Did you know that in Christ, us Gentile people, we're just as saved as the Jews in Christ? Did you know that in Christ, 
the slave is just as saved as the free man? Did you know that in Christ, females are just as saved as males are? The Gentile, the slave, and the female are not one whit less saved than the Jew, the free man, and the male. In Christ, we're all equal in his salvation. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, we come to him sincerely. We're all saved. Now, this verse doesn't speak of roles whatsoever. We, all have, we still have different roles. This is talking about salvation in Christ. It's not talking about roles. No doubt when we come to Christ, we make adjustments in our life upon conversion. We desire to live a different life after receive, receiving a change of heart. But do you know a slave and a free man will still have different roles? A man and a woman will still have different roles. Some people will use the verse that says there's no respect of persons with God. And this is true. But we still have different roles. Some women will say, well, I don't see why I can't be a pastor. It's not fair. I can do anything that a man can do because God's no respecter of persons. Okay, well, what if I decided that I wanted to give birth to a child? Would God let me do that? Because God's no respecter of persons. We still have different roles. This verse is not talking about church structure. It's talking about salvation in Jesus Christ. It can't rightly be used to support women being pastors in churches because that's not what it's talking about. If you want to find out what the Bible says concerning church structure and leadership, then we need to go to the scriptures in the Bible that talk about those things. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. In creation, God made Adam first and then Eve to be his helper. This is the order of creation. It's the order that Paul mentions in the Bible when he talks about authority. Being a pastor, another elder, or a deacon is a place of authority. Therefore, for a woman to be a pastor, a deacon, or an elder, then she would have spiritual authority over men in the church, which contradicts what the Bible says in Second, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. Now, does this teaching belittle women? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Male authority does not belittle women. Jesus Christ was given his authority by God the Father. Did that belittle Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. He said in John 14 and 28, My Father is greater than I. It's he that sent me. Why did he say that? Because in the context of the Scripture at the time, that was true. Philippians chapter 2 confirms it. He thought uh, being equal with God, he thought it not robbery. He thought it not, uh, nothing to be grasped for. So he laid aside all that and came down here in the form of a servant, didn't he? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Praise his holy name. Women are of great value in the church, folks. They need to be used. They need to be used according to their uh, uh, gifts and abilities that God has given them. Because the wife is called to be in submission to her husband, does this mean she's less than the husband, less important, less important in the eyes of God, or belittled? Not at all. Because a woman has no biblical authority to be a pastor in a church doesn't mean she's less of a person. It doesn't mean she's less important to God. It doesn't mean she's inferior in any way. All are equal before God, whether they be Jew, Greek, bond, free, male, or female. But in the church, God has set up an order. The same way when he set up the order in the family. Jesus first, the man, the woman, the children. God sets the orders, friends. What about... Women who say that they're called of God to be pastors. I don't have a doubt in my mind tonight that there's women pastors all across this nation that love their congregations. They love the Lord. They want to help people. Of course, I can't agree with them. Based on this scripture analysis here in the Word of God, I believe they've usurped the authority of a man. They've gone against the scriptures. Then there's those who say that they're called of God because of the great job that they're doing. And they're basing all this on their own experience rather than God's word. 
let's look at some common objections to women pastors. Common objections to women pastors. First of all, some people say, well, the word of God and the apostle Paul restricted a woman from being a pastor because in the first century, women were ignorant and uneducated. Friends, that's not what it's saying. That's not the case. If education were a qualification for ministry, most of Jesus' disciples would have been disqualified. It doesn't even mention that or talk anything about that. So that's not the case whatsoever. A second common objection is that Paul only restricted women from Ephesus from being pastors. Because in Ephesus, see, he wrote this to Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus. In Ephesus, there was a temple set up for a false Greek goddess by the name of Artemis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And in the worship of Artemis, this false Greek goddess, it was women who were in the authority positions. So a lot of people will say that the Bible only restricts women from Ephesus from being the pastors, and it's not talking about any other woman. Well, the problem with that is Paul never mentioned Artemis or this type of worship whatsoever in this letter to 1 Timothy. A third common objection is that Paul was only referring to husbands and wives, not men and women in general. Well, the Greek words in this passage could refer to husbands and wives. We talked about that with the husband of one wife in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The basic meaning of the words refer to men and women. No, furthermore, the same Greek words are used in verses 8 through 10 in 1 Timothy chapter 2 when it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Is that just talking about husbands or is it talking about all men? It goes on, it says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Is that just talking about wives or is it talking about all women? Well, it's obvious from looking at the Bible this is referring to all men and all women, not just husbands and wives. There's nothing that would indicate that it changes. These are the same words that's used in verses 11 through 14. There's nothing there to indicate that it changes uh, from men and women to husbands and wives whatsoever. Another common objection to this interpretation of women in the ministry is in relation to women who held leadership positions in the Word of God. Specifically, the Bible calls Miriam a prophetess. It calls Deborah a prophetess. It calls Huldah a prophetess. Uh, all in the Old Testament. Well, this fails to consider some significant information. First of all, Deborah was the only female uh, judge among 13 male judges. Uh, Huldah was the only female prophetess mentioned among dozens of male prophets. And the only connection that Miriam has to any type of leadership is the fact that she was Moses' sister. In Paul's letters to Titus and Tim Timothy, there's something new that's come on the scene. The church, the body of Christ. All these folks in the Old Testament, they're not even a concern here. We're talking about the body of Christ, and it's not talking about uh, the nation of Israel or anyone else in the Old Testament. This is talking about church and the church structure. A lot of people make similar uh, arguments, and they'll mention people from the New Testament like Priscilla and Phoebe. I like Priscilla. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila. The Bible mentions them in Acts chapter 18 and verse 26 and it pictures them as being faithful ministers of the Lord because Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos into their home and the Bible said they expounded unto him the word of God more perfectly. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but you know a lot of people will say that because Priscilla's name is mentioned first that she was more prominent in the ministry than her husband was. But friends, nowhere in the Word of God, when you read anything about Priscilla, will you find her doing one thing that contradicts what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Not one thing. They both brought Apollos into their home. They both explained unto him the Word of God more clearly and more accurately 
She's not doing anything to contradict the scripture. Some translations. Some translations, you pick up one of these new Bible translations and flip to Romans chapter 16, verse number 1, and it'll say, Phoebe was a deaconess. Our beloved King James Version says that she was a servant. Some people will translate that word as deaconess. Well, first of all, that word that a lot of these modern translations are translating deaconess simply means a female servant. It doesn't mean she held the office of a deacon. But, but, even if you do want to give her the benefit of the doubt and say that she was a deacon, which she wasn't, but just say that you, you say that she was, she was a deacon in the church, she's still, not at, uh, she's still not able to pastor or to preach the word of God to men or a mixed congregation because the Bible says that the pastor must be apt to teach. That's not a qualification of a deacon. But a pastor. Pastors are, the be, are to be the husbands of one wives. Uh, and, and to communicate this everywhere that refers to pastors in the church, the Bible uses masculine pronouns. He. Him. Things like this. Some people tri twist the scripture and they'll say that uh, women shouldn't have authority over men in the church because they're more easily deceived. Well, that's highly debatable tonight. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible said that God gave men the authority in the church because Eve was deceived. Now, friends, if women are more easily deceived, then why would we even trust them to teach, teach the kids? Why would we entrust them to teach other women who are supposedly more easily deceived? So that's not what it's referring to. That's not what the Bible said. Because of this, because the fact that Eve was deceived, God gave the primary teaching and preaching authority in the church to men. Friends, we've got to understand tonight that women excel in gifts of hospitality. They excel in gifts of mercy, teaching, and other helps. Much of the ministry in the church depends on women to get it done or it'll never get done. And that's the truth. That's the bottom line tonight. Women in the church, they're not restricted from public prayer. A lot of people will use these verses and twist them around and say a woman can't even pray. They're not restricted from prayer. They're not restricted from testimonies. They're not restricted from uh, teaching other women. They're not restricted from teaching the children. The only thing they're restricted from is having spiritual authority over the man. That's the only thing. Women, just as much as men, are called to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to this lost world. Did you know that? Women just as much as men. Because God has only ordained men to serve in positions of spiritual teaching authority as pastors and whatnot. That doesn't mean men are better teachers than women are. It doesn't mean that women are inferior and less intelligent. It's simply the way that God designed the church to function. I want to look at another scripture that's often dragged into this debate. And that's Acts chapter 2. Verses 17 and 18. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And it says, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, first of all, what we need to establish is this is what happened in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. So we can say we've been in the last days for quite a while now. I believe this passage does prove that both men and women were granted the ability to prophesy. Well, I, later on in Acts chapter 21 and verse 9, the Bible refers to the four daughters of Philip who did prophesy. Right there it is in the Word of God. So, uh, so we also know that women prophesied because rules were given in the Word of God about how they were to dress while doing so. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 5 says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is uh, even all one as if she were shaven. However, there are two errors that are made when we assert that Acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 gives women the authority to pastor churches. 
one of those assumptions is that prophets and preachers were all the same position in the church. We know that's not the case because we referred to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 last week. Paul said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. You see, there were a multitude of duties. In other words, there were some who were both preachers and prophets, but all preachers were not necessarily prophets and all prophets were not necessarily preachers. The second error is to assume that all these women who were called prophets in the New Testament did their work publicly in the church. We know that some prophecies in the New Testament were de delivered privately, one-on-one, -on -one, such as the case was, uh, as was uh, Acts 21, verse 11, when Agab Agabus, who was a male prophet, delivered a prophecy to the apostle Paul, one-on-one, face-to-face. Also in 1 Corinthians 14 and 32, uh, we learn that prophecy was under the control of the prophet. 1 Corinthians 14 and 31, Paul said that multiple prophets shouldn't speak at the same time. The Bible also limits the number of prophecies that could be given in 1 Corinthians 14 and 29. So if we can understand tonight uh, that prophecy can be regulated, then we can accept what Paul has to say next in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34 when he says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now I know this opens up a lot of questions about what if a woman doesn't have a husband, what she's supposed to do, and I understand that. And for the sake of trying to stay on track and get you through this tonight, I can't deal with that right now. We'll talk about that at a later time. But we've got to deal with these other things. Paul says it's a, it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. He's not saying this in the context of giving a prayer request. He's not saying this in the context of giving a testimony uh, or singing or praising the Lord or anything like that, but in the context of giving prophecy. So while the Bible does mention women in the New Testament who, uh, who were prophesied, they weren't allowed to do so in a public worship service. So how can they continue when the Bible plainly says in forceful terms for women to keep silence in the churches? Once again, Titus 2 and 15 says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Paul also says again in 1 Timothy 4 and 2, Preach the word, be instant in season, now to season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. In all reality, when it comes to prophecy as mentioned here, and the word of God is those who gave prophecies, it really doesn't have any bearing today anyway. It really doesn't. When you consider, and I believe this to be the truth, some of you may not disagree or may disagree with it, but I believe all of this type of activity passed away when the Bible was canonized, when the scripture came about and I'll give you the scripture for that belief you'll find it in the love chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 13 straight out of the word of God here's what it says 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, uh, verse 8 through 10 says charity never faileth but whether there be prophecies they shall fail whether there be tongues they shall cease whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away for which in fragments. He had a, a scroll here and a scroll there and a parchment here and a parchment there. We know in part. See, the Bible wasn't completed as we know it today in 66 book form until almost 300 years after Christ. That which is perfect came then. We know it's not referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ because he's not came yet. And you look back at the scripture, the context there is talking about the word of God. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And I know many of you, and we're getting ready to come to a close for tonight. See, we're still on the husband and one wife after two 
weeks of this. I know a lot of you are wondering about that woman missionary way down there in the jungles of Africa. Why do they always end up in the jungles of Africa? What about that woman missionary down there in the jungles of Africa telling everybody about Jesus? They've never heard the gospel preached before. They've never heard anything about Jesus Christ mentioned. And there she goes proclaiming the gospel, telling them all about Jesus. People are getting converted. People are getting saved all because of this woman missionary down there by herself. There's not a man around. She's down there by herself telling them about Jesus, seeing souls saved. What about her? What about her? Before you know it, she's got several converts and they start having regular meetings. But what do you do in a case like this? Well, first of all, she shouldn't have been down there by herself to start with. <laughs> Without some husband or somebody from the church to oversee her, to guide her and watch after her. But she is nonetheless. These are the things that people dream up, okay? I'm not saying that this type of thing has never happened before. But people have questions about this. So what about this woman? She's down there telling everybody about Jesus. They start having church meetings. What do you do then? In a situation like this, these extreme situations, friends, it's far more important for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. It's far more important. But at the same time, at the moment a capable man shows up on the scene, or one of those converts gets to the place where he can assume the responsibility. You know what a godly woman will do? She'll step back and let the structure of God rule. So I've hurried through this. We could have went on much more in depth about women pastors, but if we're ever going to get through these qualifications, we're going to have to move on. Now I'm going to I'm going to touch just briefly on this next one for just a minute, and then, then, I, then we'll let you go. The Bible says bishop must be vigilant. Vigilant. It's necessary for a pastor to be cautious, prudent, watchful, always being awake, knowing his whereabouts, being conscious of danger lurking about. It reminds us that the pastor of a church is a watchman. He's an overseer. He's a steward exercising responsibility of a household he's got to make sure that the children of God make it safely on their journey to heaven above he watches out for ravenous wolves and angels of darkness who present themselves as angels of light you know congregations who have vigilant pastors they'll be protected against error they'll be protected against heresy they'll be protected against low morality I'm going to stop right there we'll pick up next week with vigilance Vigilance. We'll say a few more words about vigilance next week, and then perhaps we'll get into another hot topic. Wine. The Bible says the bishop is not given to wine, but the deacons are not given to much wine. What's going on there? Lord willing, we'll get to that next week. All right, I'll ask Melissa to come to the piano. First Timothy chapter number 3. And once again, we want to read these verses to become very, very uh, familiar with these verses pertaining to the qualifications of a bishop. Paul says in verse number one, this is a true saying, if, any man, uh, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall, how, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. And we want to flip over to Titus chapter 1. Beginning in verse number 5, 
Paul says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word, if he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We left off last week with the qualification of vigilance, and that's where we want to pick up here tonight. The Bible says, once again in 1 Timothy 3 and 2, the bishop, a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. A vigilant pastor is a pastor who is cautious, he's prudent and watchful. He's fully aware of his whereabouts, his surroundings. He's conscious of hidden danger lurking about. He's a watchman and a steward who fully exercises responsibility uh, and uh, management of the church. It's his job to make sure that the children of God are safe as they journey from this life to that eternal home. He is constantly on the lookout for ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. They're out there. Amen. I assure you that they are. The vigilant pastor is on the lookout uh, for ministers of darkness who have made themselves as ministers of light. The congregation with a vigilant pastor, they'll be protected against erroneous doctrine. They'll be protected against low morality. Vigilance is the opposite of drunkenness that clouds the thinking in regard to a life of faith. When it comes to a life of faith, the vigilant pastor, he'll be able to think clearly, uh, to guard against spiritual laziness that lulls God's people to sleep and activities that draw people away from God rather than pointing people to God. We've got to be constantly on the lookout at all times, vigilant. And I've had some experiences with wolves and ministers of darkness in my short time here as the pastor of the Free Gift Gospel Mission. We've had folks come in here uh, that would have harmed the church, but thank God, God gave me the grace as a watchman, and I was ready to act. I was ready to intercept the devil. Some of you may not even be, uh, you know, know what I'm talking about, but it's happened. And uh, a vigilant pastor is one who cares for the flock, and I take this very, very seriously. Amen. That's why there are folks that I know today that will never stand up on this stage and sing a song. There are folks that I know today that will never stand behind this pulpit to deliver a message uh, unless they get saved. Amen. Because they're ministers of darkness. Thank God. I've got to be vigilant to watch out for this type of danger. The devil, he'll try to get in and wreak havoc any way that he possibly can. Uh, and we can't always just assume that it's a person we've got to be on the lookout for. It's more than just people. He'll try to infiltrate the church with uh, deranged and perverted activities. He'll try to get in with some twisted form of worship uh, and uh, things that do uh, not glorify God. The vigilant pastor has to have a backbone to stand up and say, no, this doesn't glorify God and we're not going to have it here. And I've had to do that a few times. And when it gets down to the nitty gritty, it doesn't matter who it makes mad or who doesn't like it. We've got to do things. Uh, according to the Word of God, and we've got to do things that are in the best interest of the church and God's people. Amen. Uh, and not allow damaging people, damaging activities, and erroneous false teaching uh, to come into the church of God. Today, Satan is trying to beset the church with every conceivable fad, fancy, and fiction that he could possibly imagine. And uh, that's why we hear so many churches today where the pastors come in with Bermuda shorts on and their Hawaiian flowery t-shirts and sunglasses and prop themselves up on a bar stool while they deliver some feel-good uh, self-help advice to tickle somebody's ears. And then they'll uh, turn the black lights on and drink cappuccino and try to say they're having church. But a vigilant pastor has to be on guard against this type of activity. The pastor must be vigilant. Vigilance is staying calm and collected. A calm and collected person is a much better person to have around when there's a tough decision that needs to be made. Uh, uh, he, he'll react with compassion. A vigilant pastor is a pastor who can sit back and look at a situation. 
He doesn't ignore the situation, but he'll sit back and he'll evaluate that situation before he acts. Amen. And this qualification of vigilance describes a person with a safe mind. It describes a pattern of thinking. A vigilant pastor is sensible and balanced. He's reasonable and discerning. He doesn't move from one extreme to the other extreme. He's not some goofball, but he has a serious attitude uh, toward the work of God. He's a good man to have around when a tough decision needs to be made because he's not going to jump to some kind of conclusion. He's not going to act based on his emotions. Uh, this quality comes through life experiences. I want to be a vigilant pastor, amen. And uh, this is one reason, and I can understand, uh, having been in this thing for a few years now, why a lot of churches don't want a young man as a pastor because the older man uh, is going to have uh, more life experiences to draw from. He's going to have more experiences to where he could pull from uh, to have this quality of vigilance, amen. And it's not that a young man can't be vigilant vigilant, he can be vigilant. Amen. And uh, the pastor must be vigilant. But thank God, even the young man who's vigilant, he's going to recognize that it's an older man who'll be more apt to have this qualification of vigilance. Let's move on to the next qualification. The Bible says that the bishop must be sober. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this qualification, not because it's unimportant, it's very important. Uh, but because sobriety and vigilance go together in the Word of God. They're a package deal. Uh, they're mentioned together in the Scriptures. They go hand in hand, uh, being sober and being vigilant. They come together as a pair. Now, of course, this word would include abstaining from the excesses of wine and alcohol. Now, that's certainly included in that, and uh, that's included in the meaning. But a sober pastor has nothing whatsoever in his life be it alcohol or otherwise, that's going to come along and dull and alter his senses. It goes right along with vigilance. This describes a, temp, a, a, a temperate and a calm demeanor. The pastor can't be someone with constant mood swings, someone with extremes and attitudes. He can't be a man who goes off half-cocked uh, and gets easily upset over the slightest little thing. And, of course, alcohol can have a lot of bearing on that. But there's a lot of men out there who don't even touch alcohol, who can't meet this qualification of being sober even though they don't touch alcohol because their minds aren't clear, uh, amen, and they're not calm and collected, and they're not vigilant, and vigilance and sobriety go together, and they don't meet this qualification because of these things. And alcohol has nothing to do with it. But next the Bible says the bishop must be of good behavior. This is a result of being vigilant and being sober. Good behavior. And that means that the pastor must be orderly. He must be a man who controls his passions before God and men. It means he's respectable. This refers to his observable behavior and corresponds with his ability to control himself. His inner motivations and his outer actions have got to be in perfect harmony one with another. Folks, Paul wasn't just spouting off some traditional values that were good to have 2,000 years ago but make no difference for us today. No, these can be possessed by us today in the Spirit of God uh, even here in 2010. And for the pastor, they're necessities, amen. Without vigilance, we can't have sobriety. Without vigilance and sobriety, we can't have good behavior. See, they all go together. The Bible speaks to us all when it says in 1 Peter 5 and 8, it speaks to all of us, not just the pastors, the deacons, and the elders, but all Christians. When it says, be sober, be vigilant, why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Amen. Remember what I said about vigilance and sobriety? We've got to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, yes, amen. walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's just not for the pastor. It's for you too, amen. But if pastors in particular are not given to good behavior, they'll indulge themselves in every whim and advice of the world rather than setting limits that produce a godly balance. 
in their lives. This qualification of good behavior touches on many other meanings. It, must be, it means he must be a gentleman. He has to guard his appearance. We may not want to talk about it, but all this falls under the category of good behavior. The pastor can't be a man who gets caught up in every fad and fashion, runs off and gets his ears pierced, and has the, uh, his hair dyed a different color every week. All of this is a part of having a good behavior. This is a man who can uh, feel at home with the lowly and the sophisticated. He has to be a man who can mix and establish a rapport and communicate freely with either group, every class of society. He won't be out of place if he goes to mention the, uh, visit the mansion on the hill. He won't be out of place if he goes down the road to that little shack with the dirt floor where the chickens jump up in your lap. He's got to be able to permeate all types of people and all classes in society, amen. The pastor, that's part of his duty. Why? Because he's about his father's business, amen, and he's intent on seeing it done. It doesn't matter, amen. A lot of people will say, well, I'm a simple man. I'm an old poor boy. I've got bibbed overalls on. I'm just going to preach to the poor people. And then likewise, we got some people that say, well, I'm rich and increased with goods. I don't want nothing to do with them. Let somebody else minister to them. I'm going to preach to my type of people. No, the pastor who's a God-called pastor of good behavior, he'll be able to minister to all groups. Did not Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, dine with publicans and sinners? And his behavior was without question at all times. So I'm thankful for that. Amen. He's got to be flexible. He can't just minister to one group or another because that's not what Jesus did and it's not what God calls us to do. Amen. Pastor has, has to have a good orderly uh, life of harmony and arrangement. Remember, of good behavior means orderly. He can't fall into the trap of doing what he'd like to do rather than what needs to be done. He's got to be concerned with what needs to be done. A big question here for most pastors is finding the time to fulfill the ministry obligations. And a pastor ought to be able to delegate some responsibilities. But you know, there's some people out there that'll take this verse and twist it around to try to make it mean, well, because it's not part of my job detail as a pastor of a church, they're not even going to mow their own grass. Friends, you can't pull that out of this qualification. It's true that the pastor has got to delegate his time and be watchful over his time so the devil doesn't come in and steal his valuable time, but some people are just downright lazy. You're not going to get that out of this verse of Scripture. I want to give you a good biblical example of a man of good behavior. In Luke chapter 23 and verse number 50, we see Joseph of Amarathea. Joseph of Amarathea was a council member. He didn't consent to the council's decision to go down to beg Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus Christ. He didn't consent with that. He was a man who waited for the kingdom of God, the Bible said. He went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus, took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in his own tomb. And let's look at Joseph's good behavior in these actions. First of all, let us note that a man of good behavior will not consent to the plans of evil men. Joseph of Amarathea did not consent to their plans. The Bible tells us he did not consent to their deeds. Joseph wanted to do everything that he could for Jesus. He didn't care if they looked down on him. He didn't even care if they kicked him off the council. His uh, allegiance lied with Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. It didn't matter to him. Pastors who are of good behavior are willing to do things like this. They've got to be willing to care about the people who are rejected in society. They've got to be willing to care for the people who are despised in society and they will deliberately go about their way uh, to show acts of love and kindness to those who are downtrodden, despised, and rejected in our world today. He took his own resources. He went before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus Christ, took the body down, took his own resources, uh, amen, and cared for Jesus Christ even after his cause seemed to be dead. 
You know, the cause of Christ seems to be on a decline in this world today. And in the years to come, it may even get worse than what it is now. But a pastor of good behavior will still love the cause of Christ. He'll still support the cause of Christ, even if it seems to be dying. Amen. He'll be a man of faith who uh, whose uh, faith translates into thinking about ways that he can minister to other people. A pastor of good behavior. We've got to have courageous men today who don't mind a bit to ask people point blank, what will you do with Jesus Christ? They've got to see His cause as a cause that's worth serving even if it seems to be dead. Amen. And they'll take the cause of Christ, wrap it up in linen and light in the tomb of their hearts that Jesus Christ might rise again and give them new life that they may be more like Him. This is what it means to be of good behavior. Amen. Let's move on to the next qualification. The Bible says a bishop then must be given to hospitality. You know, in the world that the Apostle Paul lived in, there was a real need for hospitality. They didn't have social security. They didn't have all these aid agencies that we have today. Christian people were under harsh persecution and they needed help and they needed care and they needed it desperately unlike anything that we've ever seen. This wasn't a new command. God had already spoken to the Jewish people years and years before this and commanded them to take care of the widows, take care of the orphans, amen, uh, and even strangers. And here the Bible says a bishop must be given to hospitality. It's talking about those who aspire to be bishops as well as those who are already bishops. They must be given to hospitality. The word is a, com a combination of two words, which means friendship for strangers. And it has a lot to do with your friends and the people that you know, but the, the main emphasis is on strangers. Amen. That's what it means to be given to hospitality. Hospitality means that you receive someone as a guest. Uh, uh, amen. It means to take into your home a persecuted Christian in particular. Even Jesus Christ spoke of hospitality when he said hospitality doesn't uh, merely repay those that had helped us because uh, we might expect to receive something in return. If we expect to receive something in return, there's no benefit whatsoever because we were repaid for our act of hospitality. And that's not hospitality at all. Hospitality is when you do something for someone and you don't expect to receive anything in return. With, uh, within the church at Paul's time, hospitality was imperative. It was a matter of life or death, okay? It wasn't like what we tend to think of hospitality today. Later on, you come over to my house and we'll have a good time, and tomorrow we'll go to your house for the same reason. No, that was, that's not the hospitality that Paul is talking about here in the Word of God. It was a matter of survival. You see, Christian people were being forced out of their homes. They were finding it hard to make a living. And this was a must for Christians in the Roman Empire. You sharing your very house and your minimal resources made the difference in whether or not somebody lived or died. You see, it was a matter of survival. That's what Paul's talking about when he said the bishop must be given to hospitality. They didn't have red roof ends. They didn't have the super eight. Many Christians were re required to travel because of persecution. Many Christians were, re were required to be on the move because they were working for the church in service for the church or out spreading the gospel. Amen. Pastors and elders were only chosen from this group of people who would open their homes and receive strangers. Yes. Amen. That's what it's talking about. Yes. This was about helping someone survive to see the next day. If you and I were Christians back in the days of the Apostle Paul, and you were traveling for whatever reason, you would automatically plan to stay at my house, and I'd automatically open my home to you. It didn't make any difference whether or not I knew who you were. It didn't matter. If you were a brother in Christ, my home was your home. That's hospitality. Amen. And by the way, 
churches back in Paul's day didn't have multi-million dollar buildings like we have now. Most of the churches were home churches. They met in folk, uh, people's homes. So hospitality was essential. But you know, all Christians are required in the Bible to be hosp hospitable. This is, again, this is not just for the pastor. It's for everyone. And you'll find verses in Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. And you'll find in 1 Peter 4 and 9. And you'll find in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 2, verses that speak of the hospitality that we ought to possess as Christian people. Since hospitality is mentioned here in Timothy and Titus, which are called the pastoral epistles, only in connection with those who serve as pastors, that tells us that although all Christian people are required by the Word of God to be hospitable, the pastor ought to lead by example. Amen. When we fully understand an authentic Christian community uh, and agape love, uh, that would lead us to uphold hospitality as a mark of love and as a mark of welcome. The pastor can't lead from a distance. An open home is a sign of an open heart and a serving, sacrificial spirit. A pastor who is hospitable, he'll use his, even his very home as a tool for trying to serve God as a tool for trying to reach out and to help people and to care for people. He'll use that as a tool physically and, and spiritually. And this type of love for strangers will be prevalent in his life. The Bible lists another qualification when it says the bishop must be apt to teach. You know, the Christian life is a life of study. It's a life of learning. And an ill-informed pastor is a contradiction in terms. A pastor can't be ill-informed. Every pastor should have the ability to shut the mouths of the gainsayers and uh, shield the church from false teaching and see to it that truth and truth alone is, a, uh, is proclaimed uh, to the congregation. Today, with high criticism of the New Testament, increasing higher and higher than ever before, and uh, the development of notorious philosophies and false teachings and the advocacy of homosexuality and abortion and all of these things place an additional burden on the pastor today to be a well-taught and able man to deal with these things. And one thing is worthy of being pointed out about this qualification of being apt to teach it doesn't necessarily refer only to a man's ability to teach, but it also refers to the qualification of having been taught as well. And it also refers to the man having a teachable spirit. Not only should he be someone who's able to teach, but he ought to be a man who can be taught. A lot of people don't want to hear this today. You know why? Because they've already arrived. They've already learned everything. They already know it all. There's nothing they can possibly learn from you. Friends, I learned a long time ago, there's something to learn from everybody. He's got to be apt to teach. And I regret this qualification is so often overlooked and tossed aside today. And this is one qualification that relates only to the bishop. In the context given, with all the heresy that was around, this qualification would include teaching and preaching and refuting heresy and false doctrine. And you know, the ability to teach doesn't have to be equal in every pastor or in every pastor candidate because the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12, let every man that ministers do so to the proportion of his faith or the, uh, the uh, gifts and abilities that God's given. So it doesn't mean we all have to be equal in our ability to teach as far as pastors are concerned, but there has to be an aptness to teach there. Amen. It's got to be present. Just because one man doesn't have as much ability as another man doesn't mean that that man's disqualified. If he can teach the Word of God and truth, he meets this qualification. And if he's apt to be taught and he has the teachable spirit and he's not so high-minded thinking that there's nothing else he can possibly learn then he'll meet this qualification. 
He's got to have a good knowledge of the Bible. He's got to have the ability, ability to communicate it with others. And at the same time, he's got to be a man who's ready to learn and to be taught also. And here's another thing. The pastor has to have this qualification at the time he's appointed. You can't put a man in as a pastor and just say, well, hopefully over time and experience and, uh, and life and maybe in a year or two he'll be apt to teach. You can't do that. He's got to be apt to teach at the time he's put in. Amen. And uh, we overlook that a lot of times. He's got to be fully acquainted with the needs of the people who are to be taught. From toddlers to elderly, it doesn't matter. This is not a man who's going to stand up and give you some kind of fancy jargon, but he's a man who's going to put it in terms that everybody can understand. That's all part of being apt to teach. If I stand up here and give you a bunch of jargon, you don't understand it. Nobody's learned anything and nothing's been taught. Well, this qualification is important. If it's not present, it's going to exclude a man from the office of a pastor church is built on the Word of God. The pastor leads the church, so he must be a man of the Word. It's non-negotiable. It's got to be there. He's got to be apt to teach. The Bible says that. Let's move on to the next qualification. The Bible says a bishop then must be not given to wine. <laughs> 